Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Penn State 365 podcast. My name is Don Cal Crowley, beat writer, recruiting analyst, a little bit of everything over at Penn State Valley Insider of the Rivals Network. I'm joined by my co host and my colleague, Marty Leap, and our resident super fan, Anthony Azan. Gentlemen, week one of the college football season is finally here. Penn State takes on West Virginia Saturday evening at 7 30 p.m. Game televised nationally on NBC. The first game of the new, uh, well, the first game for Penn State under the new Big Ten media deal with Fox, NBC, and CBS. This will be the first game of on NBC for the Big Ten. Uh, we have a jam-packed episode here today, so we'll kind of go through this one uh, quickly in some parts, uh, hit what we need to quickly at least, preview the game, and then we have some season predictions as well that we'll get to as this episode goes on. Uh, our uh, viewers on YouTube can see uh, our full uh, lineup of today's notes uh, below. And then, um, yeah, let's just get on with it, I guess, after that. But uh, the big news today, uh, gentlemen, is that Penn State uh, guard Landon Tangwall is medically retiring due to uh, what he uh, is said is an injury that would prevent him from safely playing football uh, going forward. Uh, this is a obviously a really notable hit for Penn State. Tang- Tangwall was supposed to be one of the solidifying forces of their offensive line this season. Would have locked down that left side with Aluf Shanu. Uh, just, I guess, Marty, we'll start with you. What does this mean for Penn State's offensive line? Obviously, it's a big loss, but uh, how much do you think it impacts their plans on the O-line this season? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a big impact. You know, that was something where you were really looking forward to having an extremely strong left side of the line with Landon Tangle and Olu Fashanu. Um, and you just, you're not going to have that now. I mean, thankfully for Penn State, they're very deep in the interior offensive line with J.B. Nelson and with Big Ione. They got plenty of playing time last year, and both of them impressed. Both of them, but whom by all accounts have had strong off seasons, are in a great position. Um, but yeah, man, it, it sucks for Landon Tangwall. The kid loves Penn State. He was the leader of his recruiting class. Um, he's always been about as pro Penn State as anybody you're ever going to come across. Sky high potential as a player, and when it's all said and done, he's going to end up playing in what less than ten games for his career. You know, started the first yeah. four games, five games, whatever it was last year before the shoulder got hurt and he missed the rest of the season, played, I think it was the last three or four in 2021 to reserve his, preserve his red shirt. So, yeah, it just sucks for a kid who came to Penn State with extremely high potential, extremely high expectations, and was probably well on his way to having a very strong college career that he was going to parlay into an NFL career and have it just pulled out from underneath him like this. Yeah, it really is. You you feel terrible for Landon. I mean, this was a kid who was a top 50 recruit coming out of high school in that 2021 recruiting class for Penn State. I believe rivals, had, we had him 40th in the nation, somewhere around there. Uh, so, I mean, this is a kid, like you said, who had a, t- a bright future ahead of him. Would have been playing on Sundays, no doubt. Uh, but, unfortunately, his career gets cut short. Uh Anthony, as I sent it to you, I mean, what is the big thing with this loss is not only does it force J.B. Nelson to a starting role, which J.B. Nelson is somebody that James Franklin has talked about this fall as somebody who's had a really nice camp uh, and has looked good out there. We'll see how he does against West Virginia on Saturday now that he's going to be the starter. But this kind of pushes up the development timeline for a couple guys. I mean, Vega Ione, who was supposed to be one would imagine the backup right guard to Sal Warmly. You have to imagine will kind of now probably kind of take that Drew Shelton role, except when it comes to being a guard uh, and, and play both left and right guard for Penn State. Because I'm not sure the Nittany Lions are ready just yet to you know hand it off to Alex Birchmeyer or Anthony Dunka if you know they suffer an injury. Uh, to a J.B. Nelson or Sal Warmly because, you know, one injury uh, – sorry, the Indian Lions are one injury away from either of those freshmen having to potentially play uh, a considerable role for them this uh, this fall. So just what are your your thoughts on Penn State, you know, possibly having to turn to one of these freshmen at some point this season now? 
Yeah, I mean, first off, I just want to say I hope Landon is doing okay, not just physically, but also mentally. This has to be, like, one of the most devastating things he's ever had to deal with in his life. I know Landon was somebody that, you know, it seemed like he, he, he ate, slept, and breathed football. Like, this was what – he loved football. He wants to be a football player. And I, I got to imagine this is so hard for him. So I hope he's got the support that he needs. And it seems like Penn State's going to be there with him every step of the way. So I hope he's doing okay. Well said, but, well said. But, yeah, um, I said – I was talking to my friends earlier, and I said five years ago, this would have been a devastating development for Penn State's offensive line. And it sucks, and it still hurts, and it's definitely a tough loss. But I think now Penn State is very lucky and, and blessed in a lot of ways that they have depth, and they have talented depth that they can you know, weather this loss and have a quality replacement. You said J.B. Nelson. You know, I think he's a guy that has been – you know right there in in tandem with Landon Tangwall, you know, at the left guard spot throughout spring and fall. I think he's going to come in and play really well. And as for those backups that you talked about, yeah, I think a big Ioni was a guy that we were talking about pushing Salim Wormley a little bit. I think he's going to have to take a step up. He's going to have to play both the left and the right side, kind of like Drew Shelton's doing at left tackle and right tackle. He's going to have to play both. You know, maybe Drew Shelton slides into guard from time to time and gets those reps so that if he's needed there, he can play, you know, pretty much every position on the offensive line at this point. Sure. As for Donko and Birchmeyer, I think the goal would ultimately still be to give those guys their four games and redshirt them. Obviously, they're guys that you don't want to have to rely on early on in the season. But it is possible that one of those guys ends up like Drew Shelton last year where, you know, they develop really well and maybe you get to games six, seven, or eight. And, you know, they've come along really nicely. They've taken leaps and bounds, and, and, and they're ready to see the field in a bigger capacity. So, again, hopefully you don't need them. But I think that, you know, those guys have the potential to be ready by mid to end of season if injuries happen again, knock on wood, and they're necessary to play. Well said. Very well said. I, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, Marty, uh, anything to add on top of Anthony's talked about with you know uh the backup guard positions now um and the depth there which i mean penn state we came into the season liking the ninny line's depth on the offensive line i still think we do but i mean this definitely shakes things up quite a bit uh, and it is a long season yeah no i i think you guys uh just now it, anthony now it, you know you, you ultimately still want to red shirt those guys but if you have to use them the way you did drew shelton last year um, you're going to feel okay. Just the biggest thing is, like you said, in the past, this would have been crippling for Penn State, but there's so much just improved depth in the offensive line now, especially in the interior offensive line, that uh, all in all, you, you you feel okay about this. You don't want to have a starter go down at any position, but there's few positions. Penn State was more equipped to lose a starter than on the interior of their offensive line. All right. Uh, well, I guess we'll move on uh, to some. Uh, we have it as Wednesday practice notes at the bottom, but it's really – Wednesday slash Tuesday uh, press conference notes. Uh, just a few quick ones. It really was a un, sorry. It was really a uneventful week for Penn State in terms of uh, practice notes and press conferences. Despite being week one, we got a few notable tidbits. But now that we're heading into the season, James Franklin is playing his cards very close to his chest. He's not going to give away really much uh, to opposing uh, teams going forward so the notes are going to be a little further in between but we do know four Nittany line freshmen have been greenlit for the 2023 season meaning that they will not be redshirted at least uh, that is the expectation handed to the season we do not know who the yellows are uh, or the reds uh, we will probably figure out the yellows as the season goes on uh, and and perhaps some of those yellows turn into greens we've seen that happen in the past but entering week one, the green lid players are cornerback Elliot Washington, linebacker Tony Rojas, defensive back Tony, uh, sorry, King Mack, and cornerback Zion Tracy. I don't think any of those are really a surprise for us. Uh, I mean, you, you got really just four elite athletes here, and I think that's the best way to put it. Tony Rojas is, is a well-developed linebacker already. But Washington, Mack, and Tracy are three of the best athletes on this team already. And guys, we've heard about how well they've tested, how well they've practiced with Penn State in their first uh, camps with the team. 
Uh, and I'm excited to see what these guys can do. I think Rojas could have an absolute big impact for the Indian Lions. And then Elliott Washington, Mack, and Tracy will be interesting to see what type of impact they have defensively. But I think those are three guys, all four of these guys, really, we're going to see on special teams quite a bit as well. Uh, I started with Mario last time. So, Anthony, let me start with you this time. Just any thoughts on these four freshmen heading into their uh, season here? Yeah, no, three of those guys to me are absolutely no surprise. I expected that from the very beginning. Elliot Washington, Tony Rojas, and King Mack, all those guys you know, came in as top 100, top 150 players. All those guys looked ready to play from the jump, and I think they'll see the field quite a bit, obviously, because they're greenlit. The guy that is somewhat of a pleasant surprise to me is is cornerback Zion Tracy. Sure. He was you know, a prep guy, so he was a year older than the rest of his class. Um, and, you know, he wasn't the highest rated guy coming out of high school, but it seems like he's done really well in camp. And it seems like, you know, it, he might be benefiting a little bit from the fact that the cornerback room, while it's very, very talented, isn't necessarily deep. So he might be benefiting sure. in reps from that standpoint. But you still have to come in and prove that you're ready to be greenlit, that you're ready to see the field in a, in a big capacity. And it seems like Tracy has done that. So that's definitely encouraging, not just for this year, but also for the future, considering that, you know, they're probably going to lose Dixon and they're definitely going to lose King to the NFL draft. So you need those guys ready, not just for this year, but also for beyond. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, agree with you there. Uh, Marty, any thoughts on those four? No, he said no surprises really in any of them, all of them plus athletes, all of them guys that, uh, can help make big time contributors right away on special teams. And like you guys mentioned, the, the lack of depth in the cornerback room, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're going to see the young cornerbacks greenlit either. But I think, you know, you're, you're if you're, if, if things go the way you expect this year, you expect Penn State to play a lot of lopsided games, a lot of garbage time. You want to get those young cornerbacks as much game experience as possible for next season. And, you know, at that point, you may say, hey, throw the four games out the window. If they get six, seven, eight games of garbage time, that's more beneficial for the long-term future of both them and our roster than preserving their red shirt. Very, very much agreed there. All right. Uh, no starting quarterback announcement from James Franklin this week. I don't think any of us are really surprised. I think a lot of people were hoping you'd just come out and say Drew is going to be the starting quarterback for West Virginia, but that is not the case. That being said, I think if we, all three of us, think it will be Drew come Saturday evening against West Virginia. Um, we still don't really have answers from him on the special teams either, which is, I would, I think we agreed last time, is the Ninny Lions' biggest question mark coming in the season, correct? Just that kicking game. The punting game, I think we're all confident, could be very strong for the Ninny Lions, uh, despite losing Barney and Moore. Uh, Riley Thompson should come in and be able to hold down that position right pretty well, or Alex Paquetta. Uh, but that kicking game, I think Marty said last time, that's the part of this team that if they lose two, three games, could be the major reason they lose uh, those games. I, I just, it, James Franklin could say, and I think he said this to a degree as well, he can say they've looked good in practice and all that, but it's one of those things that you really don't know how well they're going to perform until they see game action. Um, so, I mean, it's just – it's one of those big question marks for Penn State that we really don't know what the answer will be until Saturday night and maybe even beyond Saturday night because it's going to be a consistency thing. It can, can – whoever is the kicker, whether it's Sanders Sahedak or Alex Falcons, be consistent from week to week. Uh, one game is great, but – they're going to need either guy or both guys to be able to do it week in and week out, uh, especially with this schedule that has some quality defenses that they're going to have to kick field goals to win games. Uh, so I guess, Marty, we'll start with you on this one. Just uh, you still feel the same way about special teams? Any other thoughts on special teams or, I guess, any other Penn State notes uh, you have thoughts on before we move on? No, the special teams that feel the same. It's one of those, I think you nailed it. We may not even know after the West Virginia game on Saturday what, what's going to be the norm there, especially a place kicker. Um, I, I mean, I'm thinking most likely it's Sanders Sahadak gets the first crack at it on Saturday. But if Sahadak sure. comes out and looks shaky, I don't think it's going to take much to give Alex Falcons a look. And, you know, it might 
you don't want to do this. I think one thing people don't realize with kicking, it's similar to being a good hitter in baseball. There's a lot of rhythm. There's a lot of timing. There's a lot of getting in a groove. You know, anyone's ever played baseball, you know, sometimes you have those stretches where your swing's in a good spot and you're just hitting, hitting, hitting. It's very similar with kicking. You want to get your leg swing in a good spot, get in a rhythm, get in a groove. So that's where it makes it tricky if you want to keep bouncing from one hot hand to another because it's tough for those guys to get into a groove. So I'll be curious to see what happens. I mean, probably in an ideal scenario, by the time you go to Champagne in week three, you have this solved. Um, sure. If not by then, definitely by the time you come out of the bye week. But, it, you know, we'll see. Hopefully, Sander just, or whoever it is, takes it Saturday night, grabs the bull by the horns and runs with it. But, I mean, if you're a Penn State fan, no matter who is out there first on Saturday, even if they have a perfect game against WVU and a perfect game against Delaware, if they have to make a clutch kick against Illinois or against Iowa and you're feeling nervous going into it, I still wouldn't blame you because it's just you've got to see it in clutch situations. James Franklin has said it himself. They can make all the noise and distractions they want to practice. It's a totally different animal when you're out there in front of 107,000 people on a Saturday night in Happy Valley trying to make that kick, even as the home team. Absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts outside of special teams before I move on, Anthony? No, nah, no other thoughts. I mean, okay. every other position, you know, you could talk about wide receiver, you could talk about D tackle or any other position, but I think kicker is, you know, our special teams in general is by far the biggest question mark on this team. And yeah, like, like I think Marty nailed it on the head, you know, there's going to be nervous moments no matter who it is and no matter what the moment is just because they're unknowns, you know. You sure. hope that Sahada can come in against West Virginia and Delaware, nail some kicks and, you know, make it, calm the fan base down a little bit when in terms of the kicking game you know you almost wish there was a way that you can manufacture some field goal moments in those games i know that's pretty impossible to do or at least borderline impossible unless you're just taking knees at the at the red zone but you know you'd love to be able to get up big and then just have him kick a few field goals and you know show what you got and try to calm those nerves a little bit for the fan base sure yeah well, the build off of me said real quick anthony i I'm not going to be surprised if, you know, they get late in this game, they have a 2-3 score lead, this thing's on ice, and in a situation where you think they might go for it on fourth down, you see them send a field goal kicker out there for that exact reason. I, I had that same train of thought where, hey, you know what, this thing's 31-10 to 10 with eight minutes to go. It's fourth and one at the WVU 20, but let, let's let the kicker, if nothing else, for a potential momentum builder and confidence builder for the kickers. Absolutely. All right, are we ready to move on to uh, talking Penn State, West Virginia? Dude, I've been ready for like eight months. Let's get into it. The season's here. All right, well, let's get into it then. Uh, before we get into the game, go if you go over to the Penn, if you go over to Happy Valley Insider, PennStateBroad.Rivals.com, we have our visitors list up for this game. We are updating it constantly. Uh, I think we have nearly over 50 players already confirmed for this weekend. Uh, I'm not going to give away the entire list, but just some of the names on that list right now. Uh, North Catholic tight end Brady O'Hara. Uh, Central Bucks East offensive lineman Michael Carroll. Um, Imani Christian linebacker Deshaun Burnett. Uh, Cumberland Valley offensive lineman in the 2026 class Tyler Merrill. Uh, and then, of course, Central Catholic cornerback in the class of 2027, Larry Moon, a name we're going to be talking about a lot over the next couple of years. Um, those are only some. There's many other big names on this list that I did not mention. But if you go over to PennState.Rivals.com right now, subscribe to Happy Valley Insider, um, you can see that entire list today. Uh, and we'll be updating, like I said, throughout the week, uh, lean up to uh, Saturday's kick. All right. Saturday evening, 7.30 p.m. on NBC at Beaver Stadium in the Helmet Stripe game, or as James Franklin likes to call it, the sneaky whiteout. Number seven, Penn State hosts West Virginia out of the Big 12. Penn State, a 20-and-a-half point favorite here and into the weekend. Uh, that line has gone up, I believe, about four points since it, since it opened in May or so. Uh, so the public and the sharp betters out there definitely like the Nittany line center of this one. Gentlemen, this is a West Virginia team coming into this season that desperately needs a big year. Head coach Neil Brown entered fifth year at West Virginia, 22-25 and 25 in his uh, four years with 
the mound here so far. It has not been the tenure that they have hoped for in Morgantown since he took over in 2019 after Dan Holgerson left the program. Uh, so I, Neil Brown is in a desperate need of a big win to start this season, and I don't know if he's going to find one in Happy Valley on Saturday night. Uh, I guess before we br get into the specifics, just on paper, uh, in your guts, uh, what is your th overall thoughts on this West Virginia team, Neil Brown, and them coming into this season? Uh, Anthony, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I think Neil Brown is a man that is clearly coaching for his job. I mean, and he's kind of coaching, you know, with his back against the wall. You know, he's got a, um, a new um, athletic director that did not hire him. And he's got a team that has underperformed and is in danger of underperforming again. So his job is absolutely on the line. So he's probably in desperation mode a little bit. In terms of the West Virginia team in general, I actually think the offense is somewhat decent. Um, I like their run game. I think C.J. Donaldson is a quality running back. He had some really nice flashes last year as a true freshman. I think he ran for like 500 yards and six touchdowns on six yards per carry. He did pretty solid, all things considered. And I think he's a converted tight end as well. So he's a bigger back. So he adds that element to his game as well. And I think West Virginia's biggest strength is definitely their offensive line. Sure. So that's definitely the, uh, the area to watch, you know, to see how Penn State's front four um, – stacks up against their offensive line which has some quality pieces to it sure and the only other thing that stands out to me is that they have a, a very interesting defense we'll definitely get into it and maybe we can segue into that but their defense is really not good and was not good last year and probably won't be that good this year and that's the biggest thing to me that's going to hold them back from being a either solid team or even a full team potentially sure Marty, any uh, quick initial thoughts before we really get into the breakdown? No, really. I just agree with Anthony. I think this is a good offensive line. I mean, you have a legitimate All-American candidate in center, Zach Frazier. Uh, Wyatt Millam, a left tackle. I'm sure that's the name a lot of Penn State fans remember from his recruitment. And, you know, a few other guys on this line who are all Big 12, cal all Big 12 caliber offensive linemen. So, uh yeah, while West Virginia is not a very good team, there will be a nice test for this defensive line to start the season. All right, well, let's get into the breakdown then. I guess we'll start with West Virginia's, you know, Marty, sorry, Anthony talked about it. Let's, let's start on the defensive side of the ball on this one. We'll segue into that, and then we'll talk about the offense. Uh, because, I mean, while we're all, I think, very intrigued to see uh, the Penn State offense this year and what they can do. Uh, this Penn State defense has a chance to be uh, a very special one as well, um, uh, obviously. But uh, we'll start with West Virginia's defense uh, with this one. And I think Anthony said it well. The matchup to watch here is how Penn State's uh, – sorry. Uh, well, I was reading the wrong – I was reading the offensive matchup. For the defensive matchup um, – what I'm, what I'm going to be intrigued here with West Virginia's defense is just basically how Penn State's offensive line can handle the West Virginia uh, front seven there. It's not a terribly talented front seven, but, I mean, there is notable guys in there. Sean Martin, Mike Lockhart, uh, and uh, Lance Dixon, a name that Penn State fans probably haven't heard for, heard in a while. Uh, but overall, this West Virginia defense, like Anthony said, was not a strong one. Allowed 32.9 points per game last year, 171 and a half rushing yards per game. Sorry, 149.6 rushing yards per game, 262.7 passing yards per game, while allowing 412 total yards uh, a game. It just, there was no redeeming aspects of this defense for the Mariners last year. They do return a couple of those guys in the front seven, but I just look around this this West Virginia defense, and I just don't see the size, speed, athleticism that is going to be needed to slow down the Ninny Lions for four quarters. Uh, Marty, uh, let's start with you on that one. Just thoughts on this matchup for Penn State's offense. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good matchup for the offense. I mean... It's 
on paper, it's about as good of a matchup. I feel like you can get game one because it's a legitimate power five opponent, a name everybody knows, but this defense is nothing great. Um, but it's still a power five opponent. There's still some things there that could be done. It's Drew's going to have to work through. If this offense going to have to work through. Um, I will say, if you go back and look at some some of West Virginia, go a little, a little bit of a deeper dive of the defense last year, there were a lot of games where opposing tight ends just shredded them. Yeah. And you know, with Penn State's tight end room, that that's got to be something Mike Yersich and and the, the the offensive coaches are just ready to exploit. Um, I won't be surprised at all Saturday if a third starting receiver is not announced and they just announce the two tight ends and roll out in twelve personnel to start. Um, that's Penn State's strength. That is something that works really well against West Virginia's defense. I feel so. I think sure. that's something to watch. I won't be surprised if it's a big game for Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren. Sure, and worth noting that this Penn, this West Virginia defense does return uh, three safeties from last year uh, in uh, three starting safeties from last year in Aubrey Burks, Will Dixon, and Mar- Marcus Floyd. Uh, they also helped their cornerbacks room by going at, out and adding um, uh, Beanie Bishop from uh, Minnesota. They also had Montre Miller and Keyshawn Cobb out of the transfer portal. This was a Secondary that really needed the help after allowing 300 plus passing yards five times last year. Tight ends burned them a ton, like you said. Uh, they allowed 421 yards, I think, to Baylor, which was their season high. Uh, their rush defense probably not as terrible as the 149.6 yards per game says, but it still wasn't great. And they lost, you know, Dante Stills and Jordan Jefferson this offseason, but. <sighs> This is, I think, is a an off a defensive matchup for Penn State's offense. That if the I mean, I would put the Nittany Lions at at least 30 something, 30, 35 points here at least. Um, and, and I think it's a game that Nick Singleton, Catron Allen should dominate. And we see Drew make some, uh, put up some solid numbers as well. Anthony, what's your thoughts on the matchup for Penn State's offense against this West Virginia defense? Yeah, I think the biggest key for Penn State in this one, specifically Drew Aller, is just don't turn the ball over. Yeah. Play a clean game. You don't have to do anything spectacular. Get the ball in your playmakers' hands and let them do the rest. Because again, there like there really isn't a lot that you can talk about with this West Virginia defense that's a positive. There's there's no. some pieces here and there, like yeah. you said. But it it really is the weakest point on this team and it's, it's what's going to hold this West Virginia team back all year, not just sure. in this game. In terms yeah. of what West Virginia might do in this game, I could see them trying to uh, sell out against the run early because sure. I think Penn State's going to want to try to establish the run as early as they can, and I don't blame them. That seems like the right thing to do. But I think West Virginia is going to try to sell out against that, and that's, I think, where you can get Drew involved and get sure. him some easy completions, get him some, you know, some nice, maybe some screen passes and slants over the middle. Just get him some nice, easy passes, get him in rhythm. Sure. Maybe you take your deep shots after that. And that's how you open up the run game for Singleton and Allen. And then once you open up the run game, I mean, it's going to be off to the races. So sure. I think that's how, that's how they could attack it. And I think, you know, if, they're, if they do it that way, I think it makes sense. Sure. And I mean, if you're West Virginia, selling out early to stop the run and forcing the young quarterback who doesn't have a ton of you know, game experience. I mean, he had he had a decent amount, but it's not like he was he started any games last year. Forcing that young quarterback to beat you early on is, I mean, definitely. You know, I, I wouldn't be shocked by it because who if Drew goes out there and maybe you know throws an early interception and West Virginia can capitalize off it. I mean, that's the type of momentum for West Virginia that in a game like this they're going to need if they're going to win. Because, uh, like we said, they're they're gonna be they're desperate for a big win this year. Sorry, a big season this fall. If they don't go at least six and six, if not seven and five, I, I think Neil Brown's looking for a new job next year. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Anthony. Um, Marty, uh, any other thoughts on the Penn State offense versus the West Virginia defense? Uh, it, it definitely seems like a favorable matchup, and. It, it, I think what helps Penn State, too, is that there's a lot of new pieces on this West Virginia defense from the transfer portal, uh, guys who haven't started before. So having that lack of experience of playing together uh, or all starting together may benefit Penn State here as well. But 
like I said, I think the biggest thing ultimately is that this West Virginia defense doesn't have the speed, size, or athleticism to keep up with Penn State for four quarters. Yeah, I agree with all that. And, you know, we'll get into a little bit more um, when we get into our, our predictions for the score of the game on, on my feeling on West Virginia not going to keep up with them for four quarters. But one thing I will say is I think there's a scenario, and I say this as a guy who might be higher than Drew Olar than just about anybody else. There's definitely a scenario where people come out of this game thinking Drew in this passing game is a little bit further along than it probably is. Sure. Um, yeah, well, I think West Virginia, if I remember correctly, ranked 111th nationally in pass defense yeah, last year. Bad. It's not good. Yeah. So th- there is a scenario where Drew in this passing attack just shred this defense and look really good. And it's not to say they can't be really good, but I, I definitely think there's a real scenario where they come out of this with fans thinking that this passing game is a little bit further along than it probably is. But hey, you'd rather come out of it feeling that way than coming out of it feeling worried that, you know, maybe they're not where they should be at. Yeah, and it'll be really interesting to see how this West Virginia defense is as a whole this year because prior to this season, uh, sorry, prior to last season, this was a West Virginia defense in, that in 2021 only allowed 23.8 points per game and 2020 only allowed 20.5 points per game. So they have had success in the past, but last year it just went terribly wrong. And uh, I just don't know if they did enough to fix it this, uh, this offseason. Uh, let's go to the other side for West Virginia, this offense, because while the defense was questionable, terrible last year, this West Virginia offense was a, a pretty good one. Now, they did lose a couple key pieces from last year, but overall, this is still a West Virginia offense that Penn State's defense needs to respect. The Mountaineers averaged 30 and, a half, 30 and a half points per game last year, 171 rushing yards, 227 passing yards. Uh, for just under four, 400 yards per game. Um, and I think the key matchup here to watch for West for West Virginia's offense against Penn State defense, which Anthony kind of alluded to, was how does Penn State's front four, specifically the defensive tackles, match up against this West Virginia offensive line and against a West Virginia rushing attack that was pretty successful on the ground last season. Uh Coming to the season on the defensive side of the ball, the big question has always been the defensive tackles. How can Penn State's rush rush defense improve from last year? This is a big test. Tony Mathis, West Virginia's starting running back, rushed for 562 yards and five touchdowns last year and 135 carries. Um, He did enter the transfer portal, so they had to go and dip down into, uh, into the depth chart. At C.J. Donaldson, who didn't play a ton last year, but did show flashes of uh, some plus athleticism, looseness, vision. It's hard to tell what we're gonna, what West Virginia is gonna get out of him on Saturday. But we know this is a West Virginia offense that's had success rushing the ball in the past, and there's no reason to think with this returning offensive line that they're not gonna have success against this season. Are you worried, Marty, about Penn State's DTs against this West Virginia rushing attack? I'm not worried. I mean, I think it'll be a good test for them. I think this is a defensive tackle group that, I mean, I definitely think they're going to be able to prove something to start the year, too. They've spent all offseason hearing, you're the weak link of this defense, you're the weak link of this team. If this team doesn't make the playoff, you're probably going to be why, et cetera, et cetera. Um, getting Kazai Izzard back healthy in time for opening day is huge, of course. I mean, Hakeem Beeman has seemingly generated about as much buzz as anybody on the defense this offseason into fall camp. Jordan Vandenberg's done some really nice things. So I'm not worried about it. Like I said, I think this is a good test for this defensive line group, specifically the DTs, because this is a good West Virginia offensive line. Um, and they're going to want to run the ball a lot, especially because I think if there's any any hope for West Virginia to pull this off, it's they lean heavy on the run, they bleed the clock, they shorten the game you know, take away possessions from Penn State that way. So I expect Neil Brown and offense coordinator Chad Scott to come out and want to run the ball a lot. But, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I think it's going to be a good test for them. I I think they'll be okay. I don't – what did you say they averaged last year? 170 yards per game on the ground or whatever. Definitely want to see them getting there. I mean, Neil, Neil Brown even said in his press conference on Monday, Penn State's defense is the fastest, most athletic defense they're going to face all season. Sure. Um, and there's going to be a lot of coaches saying that this year. Other yeah. – then 
you know, the, the coaches who also have to play Michigan and Ohio State, and I think Penn State's defense is probably faster, more athletic than Ohio State's, if not Michigan's as well anyway. Um, yeah, it's I, I think it'll be a nice test for this defensive tackle group, this defensive line group against a good offensive line, some good running backs. But ultimately, I think they're going to be okay. I, it, I, I don't really see them having any major issues on Saturday. Now, the, the what is worth knowing about – this rush attack this year with C.J. Donaldson is C.J. Donaldson is a former tight end slash wide receiver turned running back for West Virginia. Uh, and I alluded to what he did last year, uh, eight, 87 carries, 526 yards, and eight touchdowns. Uh, six foot one and I think 230-some pounds. I, th- this is going to be a running back that's, got, I think, a good early season test for Penn State's front seven especially, especially when you're going to face guys down the road like um, – Trayvon Henderson, uh, Blake Corn, Don, Donovan Edwards, uh, and a couple other guys in there, obviously as well. But uh, they're gonna have to be. Ma- they're gonna have to make sure their tackling is quite sound this week. I mean, tackling early in the season has been a problem for Penn State in the past. They have been able to, you know, uh, get by those issues without too much harm done. But this will be a, a good early tackling test, I think, for them. Uh, on Saturday. Anthony, any worries for you about that uh, front four for Penn State going up against this West Virginia rushing attack? I wouldn't call it the worries, but it's definitely something they're going to have to game plan for. Sure. It's definitely something they're going to have to be ready for. You know, West Virginia, I think you know what they're going to do. You know, they have a first year starter as well, and a guy that, you know, as much as he might be a gamer and he might be a very tough player. He doesn't have the talent that a guy like or the potential that a guy like drew does so you know they're going to lean on their run game and what they can do with that pretty heavily so yeah penn state's going to have to be stout in the front four and they're going to have to be ready for that it reminds me a lot of like the minnesota game from last year because this west virginia team while their offensive line is good and while their running back is good they're not michigan good you know like it's not like you're getting ready for like a michigan type team but a minnesota type team where they always have a tough offensive line and they had a really good running back at mo ibrahim it it feels very similar and penn state did a really good job game planning for that and i think the game plan this year is going to be pretty similar so we'll see if uh facing a, a dual threat quarterback and garrett green gives them any problems but if i'm worried about the run game stopping it not really. They might break off some runs here and there, but I don't think. Yeah, I, I'd be pretty surprised. Again, knock on wood, if if Donaldson like breaks off some big runs and has a really big day on us. Yeah, I think that's a very fair assessment of the matchup overall. I think Penn State's gonna keep it in check. It, could West Virginia rush for a hundred and twenty-five, hundred thirty something yards? Sure, but I and, but I think that's because West Virginia is not gonna have much luck passing the ball in this game uh moving to the pass attack for west virginia you alluded to garrett green taking over as the starting quarterback it hasn't officially been said yet by neil brown but that is what is expected for saturday he takes over for jt Jan- daniels who's now at uh rice uh his what fourth fourth program now um hard to believe how that career has gone uh green saw a considerable amount of playing time last year completed 55 per Point one percent of his passes for 493 yards, five touchdowns, and three interceptions. Like you said, Anthony, he does have a bit of a dual threat capability to his game. Added 276 rushing yards and five touchdowns on the ground last year. Um, that being said, this West Virginia wide receiver room did lose quite a bit from last year. In total, they lost 160 receptions, two, almost 2,000 yards, and 16 touchdowns just with the departures of Bryce Ford Weed and Caden Prather and Sam James. Uh, instead, they'll turn to Devin Carter, Cortez Braham, and Deshaun Polk as their uh, likely wide receivers to lead the team this year. Um, I Against this Penn State secondary, I just don't see West Virginia's pass attack doing all too much. Green may be able to make some nice throws here and there, but I don't see them having any sustained success throughout this one. Um Anthony, uh, we'll start with you on that one. If you have yeah, any thoughts. I think, yeah, I think if Garrett Green's going to have any success against this secondary, it's going to be because he, you know, evades the rush, gets out of the pocket, and then finds an open receiver once he, you know, gets out of the pocket and scrambles a little bit. 
I, I think he is going to be, you know, he's going to be elusive and he's going to be a guy that, you know, he's, he's, he could cause a little bit of trouble. I wouldn't sure. be surprised if he makes some plays and we're like, oh, wow, that, that was a nice play. But, you know, again, I think if you can keep him in the pocket, if they can prevent him from scrambling and get to him, it, it, it's going to be, it could be a long night for West Virginia in that regard because, yeah, I, I think they're I, I don't see them having a ton of success in the passing game. I don't see them having the playmakers that they're going to need to have success yeah, on guys like Kalen King and Johnny Dixon and our safeties. So, you know, never say never, but I, I would be pretty surprised. Biggest playmaker may be Devin Carter, of course, former Penn State transfer portal commitment before you ended up flipping to West Virginia. But I mean Carter was a guy that when he committed to Penn State, we, we weren't saying he was gonna come in and be this high impact guy. He was he was going to be a nice piece for the wide receiver room, but we, we didn't see a guy who was going to come out and dominate on a week-to-week basis. And I don't expect him to do that for West Virginia either. He'll be a nice piece, though. Uh, Marty, any thoughts on uh, West Virginia's passing attack going to go again up against arguably the top secondary in all of college football? No, I agree with everything Anthony said. I mean, you have a lot of questions about quarterback and wide receiver. I mean, I, I think the Devin Carter thing, you put it perfectly, Dylan. He's expected to be the guy at West Virginia, and he was going to come to Penn State. And, I mean, look at Dante Cephas. Probably would have been in a similar position of, you know, hey, competing for a starting role and, you know, just wasn't going to be the guy. So, yeah, I mean, I know I, Rodney Gallagher also named to watch there, obviously another name Penn State fans will remember from last recruiting cycle. I'm sure West Virginia is going to try to get him involved sure. um, for a lot of different reasons too. But, yeah, it's – I, other than Ohio State, with this secondary, they're not going to face a passing attack this year that worries me. And even Ohio State's is not going to worry me all that much because this secondary is really freaking good. Absolutely. Um, and I should have mentioned, OC for uh, West Virginia is Chad Scott. The D.C. is Jordan Leslie. The Mountaineers did go 5-7 and seven last year, 3-6 and six in Big 12 play. Overall, guys, I think the best way to put this, and uh, we didn't mention it, but should be mentioned, West Virginia special teams last year were a disaster, uh, when it, especially when it came to uh, defending uh, opposing return games. Um, so that's something else I could play into Penn State's uh, favor here, potentially on Saturday. Um, but overall, guys, I just I don't know if I see any avenue for West Virginia to really have a chance to win this game. Unless Penn State goes out there and just uh, offensively turns the ball over multiple times and defensively forgets how to play uh, the defense that they played so well last year. And I know that's probably not the best way to put that, but, I mean, I just, this is a 20-and-a-half-point spread for a reason. Um, and this is not a Power 5 versus Group of 5 matchup. This is, a, this is Power 5 versus Power 5. The fact that Penn State is a – week one favorite of that magnitude against our power five program that is you know i know low expectations but it's still been a reasonably quality program over the last decade or so it says a lot about what people think about this penn state team and uh, and i agree with that spread that uh, that i just i don't think west virginia is going to be able to keep this one close for more than half if this is a 10 point game at halftime i wouldn't be surprised but i think this is a game that penn state can definitely pull away in the second half if they don't do so sooner. Um, so I guess uh, let's go around and give our predictions for this game and any final thoughts. Um, who won last time? Was it Anthony won last time? So I guess, Marty, what is your prediction for the game? Any final thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on the spread. I'm not going to be betting this one. If if I were, I would be taking Penn State minus 20 and a half. Um, I think, Honestly, the main reason I'm I'm not going to bet it is because there's just not enough value there to be worth me putting money on it. Um, and I think the spread, but, yeah. I think the over under is uh, 50, 50 and a half right now. Yeah, over under fifty and a half. I'd I'd go the over there, but uh, yeah, I I could see this being very similar to the Auburn game last year. A bit of a slow start. West Virginia is leaning on the running game, trying to shorten the game, keep Penn State's offense off the field. You might see James Franklin take a couple more chances again, similar to early in the Auburn game, because he knows that they, they outman and out physical that team across the sideline, especially this being Beaver Stadium. So I'm not going to be shocked if we get to halftime and this thing something like 
you know, 17-10, 17-7, whatever it may be, and people are freaking out, and then we get to the end of Penn State wins comfortably. So I, I'm going to say give me Penn State 41-14. to Again, I, I could see them starting slow and then just pulling away in the second half and putting this one on ice, similar to the Auburn game last year. But, yeah, I'll, I'll say 41-14, Penn State gets the dub and starts the year 1-0. and All right. Anthony, what is your pick for week one? One, for the Penn State's week one matchup against West Virginia. Any final thoughts? Yeah, my final thought is I never should have told you guys my prediction before the recording because y'all just stole both aspects of my prediction in your comments. So I, I've, I've been saying for a while now, uh, I think Penn State's going to be up 17-7 at half. I do think West Virginia hangs in it for a little bit, keeps it interesting. I think they're going to be you know, throwing everything but the kitchen sink at Penn State, some trick plays. I'm going to try to be physical. And I think in the second half, Penn State's just going to be too talented. They're going to be too deep. And they're going to wear out this West Virginia defense specifically, which does not have the depth or talent to keep up for four quarters, like you said. And Penn State's going to pull away in the second half. I think they're going to win 38-10. to 10. All right. So Marty has 41-14. Anthony has 38-10. And you guys kind of summed it up my final thoughts as well pretty well and i kind of gave mine as well before and so i'll just get my final score here give me penn state 45 west virginia 17 i think penn state uh is up maybe like 21 24 uh 10 at halftime and then west virginia gets a second half touchdown but penn state dominates for most of the game and uh wins this one big to start the year one and up all right uh, well, now that we're through that, let's kind of get into a little bit of a quicker uh, prediction segment here. We're going to run through some Penn State season predictions, uh, some over-unders for Penn State, uh, and then we'll do our 2023 college football predictions, including our college football playoffs. All right, gentlemen, the Penn State over-under for wins entering the season is nine and a half wins. Um, uh, let's just kind of go through this one quickly. Um I'm going to say over nine and a half wins for Penn State. You guys can give your record predictions. Uh, if you who have, you guys have them losing a the game, just say who they lose to. And if you want to give a reasoning, feel free. Uh, but I'm going to go over the nine and a half. I'm going 11 and one for Penn State. I think they split the Ohio State Michigan games. I do not know which one they're going to win or lose right now. Uh, I think it's very possible they, not very possible. I think it's possible that they win both. I think it's also very possible they lose both games. I think a 10-2 season is, is a solid season for Penn State, depending on how those games are. 11-1 is, however, what I'm going to officially be going with here. Uh, like I said, they're going to split Ohio State and Michigan, and I think their games, they may have a close one against, you know, somebody they shouldn't, maybe in Illinois and Iowa, uh, a Michigan State, but I think for the most part, the Nine Lions take care of business this regular season. Split those two big ones, finish the season 11 and 1. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll give my pick of who goes to the Big Ten Championship game uh, in the 11 and 1 because I do have a, a tie among the three Big Ten East teams. Uh, Anthony, what is your over under win for Penn State? Over on win total? I'm also going over. I think, you know, over nine and a half feels, you know, I, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, I am also going to go with 11 and 1. I think they do split Ohio State and Michigan, like you said. Uh, to be a little different, I'm going to give a prediction on that. I'm going to say that for the first time in over a decade, they go into Columbus and they beat Ohio State on the road, which sounds bold, but I'm, I'm going to be bold here. And I'm going to say they lose to Michigan at home, which sounds like the, you know, sounds like you go the other way. But sure. this is I... a very good Michigan team. Sure. And I, I do think that even though Penn State goes 11 and 1, I, I think Michigan goes 12 and out. So that that's that's the trade off there. That's fair. All right, Marty. We got 11 and 1. We got uh, we got 11 and 1 for both of us. Uh and basically again they're in the same avenue. Uh what is your prediction for Penn State this season? I am also going to go 11 and 1. I'm going to be in the same boat as you, Dylan. I don't know where it comes, but I think they split the big 2. Um, I think those three will round robin each other this year. I think we get a scenario where at the end of the end of the year, 
All three of them are 11 and one. And based off everything I have gathered, most likely would put Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game because of strength of schedule from their uh, opponents from the West. But um, yeah, I, I think Penn State goes 11 and one. And even if they go 11 and one and don't get to Indy, I don't by any means think that means they can't make the playoff. I think there is a real scenario where an 11-1 Penn State team that does not make it to Indianapolis still ends up in the playoff. I, uh, I, I definitely think that is a possibility. All right, uh, some fun over-unders. We kind of touched on these at the, last, at the end of last podcast, but we'll kind of do them again here. Just give me your over-under. I'll give you my over-under. Say over-under to the number. Uh, for these numbers, uh, I kind of went out and uh, – Kind of looked at what the highest numbers for the last few season were for Penn State. Kind of tried to find an average uh, and factored in a, a couple other factors as well. All right. So, uh, Drew Aller touchdown passes. 27, sorry, total touchdowns, not, to, not touchdown passes. Total touchdowns. 27 and a half, over or under. Marty? Yeah, if we're going going total touchdowns, definitely over. All right, over 27 and a half. Anthony, over under 27 and a half touchdowns for Drew. Total touchdowns. Yeah, I'm, I'll say over total touchdowns, but touchdown passes, I'll go under. Okay. I, I have it, I have that over as well. I think I could see 25 passing touchdowns, five rushing touchdowns, something like that. I think with his size, when they're in the red zone, I think there's a good chance that they use that size to their advantage at times. Um. Drew passing yards, uh, 2,950. I, I basically took what uh, Sean Clifford averaged over the last three seasons and added a little bit more to it. So over under 2,950 passing yards. Marty? Oh, this one's tough. I it, think... I think I'll go under largely because they're going to want to run the ball a lot, and I think they're going to bludgeon a lot of teams and not have to throw the ball a lot in a lot of their games, but it won't shock me if it ends up as an over. Yeah, at this point, it's basically, do you think Drew hits 3,000 passing yards? Anthony? To, it's another, again, another tough one. I'm in Marty's boat. I have absolutely no idea, but to be different, I'll go over. I'm going to say, even though he doesn't throw a ton of touchdowns, he has a lot of passing yards, and he'll go over. I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over. Uh, I, I think the touch, the pass touchdowns may not be there, but I think he's going to have a lot of nice uh, yardage games uh, this season. All right. Nick Singleton and Katron Allen total touchdowns 25 and a half. They had, I think, a combined 22 last year. I am going to go under. I'm going to say 25. Well, just because saying under and saying they're going to get 25 and 25 and a half is such a cowardly thing to do, I'm going to go over. No, I'd go over anyway. I mean, in my mind, you look at early in the season last year when Kevon Lee was still getting touches, that probably took a couple touchdowns away from them. Um, And especially, again, if we're doing total, if we're going to do passing and rushing combined, I definitely think that's over 25 and a half. If it's not, Penn State's probably not where they want to be come November. That's fair. Oh, yeah, good point. If it's passing touchdowns included, I'll take the over as well. If I was just thinking rushing touchdowns, which which could be interesting for that over-under. But total touchdowns, I'll take the over. They're going to be such a focal point in this offense. Sure. All right. Uh, total yards for those two, passing and rushing. I said it. I think I said it too low, but whatever. Uh, let's. Uh, I'll move it up a little bit. Uh, 2,350 over under total combined yards for those two. I, I think they're just on, they're just on two, two grand combined last or just over two, 2,000 last year combined. I'm still going to say under because it's, yeah. it's so hard for two running backs on one team to get like 1,200 yards each. Yeah. And that's so. what it, that's like, I know, like, Singleton gets 1,500, Allen gets, like, 1,000. I get that. But that, that's, like, so hard to do. So I'm going to say under still. I'm going to go under just because 
I, I think they're going to get close. I just don't think they're going to get just there. I think 2,000 yards is very much in, in their real house this year. Uh, and then 2-250, two, 2-3 two two uh, could be as well. Marty, over under 2,350 total yards. I'm, I'm, if, yeah, for total yards rushing, I'm, I'm also going to go uh, no, under. This is, this is total yards rushing and passing. Uh, uh, or receiving, or receiving, I should say. I thought this was just rushing. Um, man, that's tough. I think I'll still go under. But, again, this is going to be one that's not going to surprise me to throw over. They're both just really good. But like Anthony said, when you have two backs, it's going to be difficult to get both of them the yardage. And, again, not to keep going back to this, but when you expect there to be as much of a gap between yourself and a lot of teams on your schedule as Penn State does this year, there's going to be a lot of fourth quarters where those two are not getting a lot of touches. So I think that's a factor here as well. Sure. All right. Um uh, I didn't pick uh, a certain player, just did a uh, team's receiving leader over under 675 and a half yards. I'm going to go, I'm going to go under. Cause I think this is, like I said, last podcast, I think this is a guy, this is an offense that's going to have multiple guys in like the three and maybe four hundreds, but I'm not sure there's going to be one guy who really puts up huge numbers. I'll go over. I think really? Keandre Lambert Smith eclipses that. I, sure. I think Lambert Smith winds up with at least 700 yards this year. Um, so, yeah, I'll go over. Anthony? I'll agree with you, Dylan. I'm going to go under. I just think there's a lot of receiving options on this team. I think they're going to rotate quite a bit. Even though I could see Lambert Smith getting close, I could see Theo Johnson getting close. I, I think there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and that's going to prevent someone from having a really huge year. So I'm going to go under. All right. Uh, and then final over under teams touchdown receptions leader eight and a half. I, I, I feel I, I felt like this was a pretty strong number because I think eight is probably where uh, Theo can end up quite easily, uh, depending on how the season pans out. You read my mind, Dylan. I was gonna say over. I'm going to be bold a little bit, say over. I'm going to say Theo's the one that hits the over because I think he's just going to be such a red zone target, and I think he's going to get more than eight. I don't know. Just being bold. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to also go over. I, I, I think I think uh, Theo or maybe somebody like uh, Harrison Wallace can get eight or nine this year. I, I think Harrison, Harrison Wallace is going to have a really nice season. It's a tough one. I'm. I agree with everything you guys said about Theo Johnson, but I will say under part of it being, I think Tyler Warren's also going to get his fair share sure. of targets in the red zone. I won't be stunned to see Khalil Dinkins get some targets in the red zone. Um, I'm with you on Trey Wallace, good jump ball guy when you're down close to the end zone. So, uh, yeah, I'll say under, but I'm definitely not going to be surprised if Theo Johnson winds up going north of eight and a half. I mean, I'll, I won't be surprised either if Keandre Lambert Smith goes north of eight and a half touchdown catches, but I'll say under. All right, and now four quick hitters. Just say the name, and we will then move on to our next section here as we're almost done. Uh, all right, Penn State's touchdown leader, not, not doesn't count Drew, non-passing touchdowns here. So touchdown leader, who's it going to be? Uh I'm gonna. I. It's obviously gonna be one of the running backs. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Probably have to go with Nick. But I, I think Nick and Katron are gonna be pretty close uh, in their touchdowns this year. Yeah, yeah. What if we did instead of like? What if we excluded the running backs? Excluded. Oh, okay, let's exclude the only, running backs. Only receivers oh. and tight ends. Because I feel like it's obvious everyone's gonna say Singleton. Sure, sure. That's, good, Allen, that's a good but... one. That's a good one. All right. Non running backs nor Drew. Who leads the team in touchdowns? Give me. I'm gonna go. I, I think I know who Anthony's gonna go, and I want to be a little different. So I'm gonna go with Trey Walls. Give me Trey Walls. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously gonna go with Theo. I said he's gonna go over yeah. in touchdowns. So give me, give me yeah. Theo. I, I think I, I think Theo is probably the best option, but I, I'll be different. I agree. I think Theo's the best option, but to be different, because I said I won't be shocked if he goes over eight and a half himself, I'll go with Keandre Lambert-Smith. That's a good one. All right, team tackle leader. Uh, give me Curtis Jacobs. 
this year. Give me Mr. Carter. I'm staying with linebacker. Let's round it out. Give me Kobe King. All right. Uh, Kobe King. That's a good shout. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big Kobe King guy. You guys know that. I think we he's going to excel this year as the Mike. I definitely agree with you there. I think he's in for a big season. All right, Sacks leader. Give me Deny Dennis Sutton. And if he you. I like it, but you went for the bold pick earlier. I, I know, I know. I, did. I I've been I've been preaching to die, deny Dennis Sutton the last few weeks here, uh, and we're going to no, continue I with it. it. Uh, I, I I and my reasoning for it is I think so much is going to be on Chop and Adiza that deny. I mean, is going to have his plenty, his fair share of opportunities. I mean, uh, what would be really fun is if they got. I don't, I don't know if they would ever do it, uh, do it this year, but. Take out a DT and put out three defensive ends, basically out there. Somehow get Chop on the, sorry, get the nine on the field with Chop and Adisa, and I, I think let him feast. Uh, I mean, uh, let him feast. Uh, but yeah, let me. I'm gonna get the nine, and uh, give me seven sacks. Marty, what do you got? You don't have to give Man, the sack I number, like but I pick like Ch- Chop Robinson is such an easy pick here. But I think opposing offenses are going to focus so much on not letting Chop Robinson wreck things that that can open it up. Man, Chop's the easy pick. It really is. He's probably going to lead the team in sacks, but I'm going to go with the sticks. Give me Abdul Carter. I think Manny Diaz is going to be ready to just on third down or obvious passing situations like they did with LeVar Arrington back in the day, like they would have done with Micah Parsons in 2020. Hey, Abdul, go get the quarterback. Give me Abdul Carter. I think he winds up leading this team in sacks. I like it. You guys are good. You're really good. But I'm going with the easy picks for y'all. I'm going with Chop. I mean, I get what you're saying, Dylan, about how, you know, or Marty said, excuse me, how, you know, they could chew in on Chop, focus on him, and and that could open things up for others. I think there's so many talented players on this there defensive is. front and like that you really can't just focus on one guy. Like yeah. if you focus on top, all right, fine. Adis is going to wreck you. Dennis Sutton's going to wreck you. Carter's going to wreck you. Curtis Jacobs is going to wreck you. There is nothing you can really do to focus on just one man. Sure. So I think chop is still going to have plenty of one-on-one matchups, even if you get double teamed on occasion. So yeah, g- give me chop. I-, I know it's the easy pick, but someone's got to pick it. Yeah. And I, I think what's exciting about the sacks, uh, sacks thing is uh and like i said i don't think what i was saying would deny again you know 3d defensive ends out there i don't think it's going to happen i don't even know how viable that really is i'm sure somebody has tried it before uh but with manny diaz and the type of defensive mind he is and how much he loves creating chaos it's something i also would never rule out with manny diaz he's going to find a way to get these guys like deny dennis sudden abdul carter uh even the other linebackers, Tony Rojas, uh, Keon Wiley, Curtis Jacobs, in positions to go out and create chaos in that backfield. And, and that's, why I think, one of the most exciting features of this Penn State defense. Oh, I mean, I definitely think we see three defensive end sets on and obvious passing downs. Sure, sure. I think we see deny bump inside with Zane Duran as the other DT and Abdul Carter just kind of out there freelancing and doing what he wants to try and go kill the quarterback. I definitely think we see a lot of that this year. Yeah, I, yeah I, I think, I mean, third and long, why not? I mean, no offense to Penn State's DTs, but there's nobody right now that you look at like, oh, uh, they're going to be able to go out and be, you know, a great pass rusher. Why not just throw out the, as many pass rushers as possible and just get to the quarterback? What, what What's going to happen? They, they dump it down on third and 15? Um, all right, Penn State's interception leader will be who? Give me Johnny Dixon. Johnny Dixon, that's a good one. And for the same reason I said that Kalen King would lead him last year is because I think teams are going to look away from Kalen King as much as they possibly can because he's a freaking stud, which means that Johnny Dixon is going to get a lot more looks and a lot more throws his way, which means he's going to have more interceptions. Sure, great one. On a similar train of thought, I am going to maybe a bit of an outside-of-the-box pick, a guy who I think is vastly – undervalued i'm gonna go daquan hardy oh, um, nice. again i think teams are not gonna want to throw a king 
I think teams are going to want to not throw at Dixon very much either if they don't have to. And I think Hardy in the slot kind of becomes the guy. And I think Daquan, I could definitely see a scenario where he winds up uh, leading this team in interceptions. Well, I don't want to be the guy who goes with the obvious pick, so I'm not going to. So I'm going to go with last year's uh, spring and fall camp turnover king. Give me Zaki Weevley. Penn State's safeties have always been great ball hawks. Weedley showed flashes last year. I mean, in that interception he had against Auburn stands out. Uh, give me Weedley or really any of these safeties to lead the team in interceptions this year. Good pick. I thought about Weedley. That, that, that's a good pick. All right. Moving off Penn State quickly, we'll give our five con- Power 5 Conference champions our four college ball picks, our national champion, our, and our Heisman Trophy winner before we get into our quick Big Ten Week 1 picks. And I do promise everybody in our future episodes they will not be as long as this. We'll keep those for 45 minutes to an hour. But, all right, rap, rapid fire once again, 2023 college football predictions. Everybody, ACC champion, give me Florida State. I'm with you. Give me Florida State. I'm not there yet. Give me Clemson. All right. Big Ten champion. Uh, while Marty did point out the, the thing about uh, the tiebreakers favoring Ohio State, I don't know how it's going to happen f- with my pick, but uh, give me Michigan to win the Big Ten. It hurts my soul to say it. I still think Penn State goes 11-1 and one and makes the playoff, but give me Michigan to win the Big Ten. I just think they're really, really good. <laughs> Like I said, in the 11-1 scenario, most likely tiebreakers, the Buckeyes going to Indy. Um, I'm always going to pick who wins the East, so give me the Buckeyes. All right. As big, much as that also hurts my soul. Big 12, I'll take. This one I wanted to go fancy and pick, like, Kansas State to win it again. Um, but it's hard to pick against this Texas team heading into the season, though I am usually one of the biggest haters on the entirety of, you know, picking Texas to do well. But give me Texas. Not very hard to pick Texas at all. They've been average for like 10 years now, 15 years. Uh, give me Kansas State to win it again. I, I really I'm a believe big Will Howard. Howard. Guy. Yeah, I'm a big Will Howard guy. And I Pennsylvania boy. State team. Yeah, Downington boy. Same school as uh, Drew Shelton, I believe. But yeah, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big Will Howard guy. I, I think this Kansas State team is scrappy. I love their coach, Chris Kleiman. Yeah. Uh, give me Kansas State to repeat. Sure. I just feel like if it's not now, it's never for Steve Sarkeesian in Texas. So get, I, I know it's not going to happen, but give me the Longhorns. They'll screw it up somehow. I have no doubts in my mind. That they'll screw it up, but give me the Longhorns. All right, Pac-12 champion. Kind of another team just like Texas where I somehow have my doubts that they're somehow they're going to win it. And I flirted with picking Washington. Utah or Oregon State in this because I do think the Beavers are going to, you know, have a chance to really surprise people again this year. And with DJU, if he's able to be comfortable and take that next step, I think it's possible. But it's hard to bet against the former, the defendant Heisman Trophy winner. And if USC's defense can even take the smallest step forward, I think they can do it. Give me USC to win the Pac 12. Last year, the Pac-12, and I have absolutely Rip. no idea who to pick to win their conference. Rip. Rest um, in peace, Pac-12. USC, I mean, yeah, the well, USC sounds like the easy pick with your Heisman quarterback, but, man, that defense just gave up 28 points to San Jose State, and they looked really bad doing it, too. <laughs> I so guess I'm really subscribing good. to the belief that they will outscore 95% of the people on their schedule. That's fair, but that 5% is, is the games that matter, right? That 5% so, is Utah, probably. Utah or Washington. So, how's Oregon looking this year? I actually have no idea. They could do it. They could do it. But I would put, I would put, I think Washington's my number two. Oh, man. I actually have no idea what to say. Give me Washington, I guess. I just do not believe. I I just don't believe in this USC defense. That's the only thing from saying USC. For what it's worth, I don't either, but I'm kind of doing what Marty (laughs) did with, with Texas. Like, my gut is just saying USC, but I know, my, I know they'll mess it up. Uh, Marty, Pac-12 champion. Give me Washington. Washington. I'm, I'm big on the Washington Huskies. I think Kellen DeBoer is an incredible coach. Even though Michael Penix still has yet to score on that two-point conversion try from 2020, he's a very good quarterback. They have weapons at receiver. 
Their defense is light years ahead of USC. That's true. Give me the Huskies win the Pac-12. Um, if if Huskies win the Pac-12 and that offense does what they did, Michael Penix may find himself in New York come December. Um, Very easily. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, all right. SEC. This is a hard one because Alabama's quarterback situation is, you know, a big question mark. Georgia's is somewhat of a big question mark as well, which made me want to go, could LSU potentially, you know, sweep in and win the SEC? But, no, I'm still going Georgia. I think the Bulldogs are very well on their way to potentially a three-peat. I was about to say, go bold here. You won't. You won't do it. No but, chance. But, no. I like, I like LSU. I, I, I could see LSU easily being the team that comes out of the SEC West. But, no, it, it's going to be Georgia. Like, their defense is always stout. I think Carson Beck's going to be just fine at quarterback. You know, they're going to be able to lean on their run game. Give me Georgia to repeat. 2008 was the first year Alabama won the SEC West with Nick Saban. Every year since then, Alabama has not been the preseason pick to win the SEC West. They've gone on to win the national championship. Give me the Crimson Tide to win the SEC. I think Saban is out to prove something this year. I think that roster is out to prove something. Give me the Tide. All right. a quarterback before they can prove anything. Before we get to the college football playoffs, give me your guys' Heisman pick. I'm going – Jaden Daniels at LSU. This was a really tough one. I was debating it before we came on. You guys saw me debating it. Uh, I really don't know who's going to win. I I, I want to say Caleb Williams, but I just have a hard time seeing him win it two years in a row. So give me Jaden Daniels. It really feels like a wide open race this year. Like, yeah, like Caleb Williams might be the obvious pick, but I mean, the last time somebody won the Heisman two years in a row was, what was it, 1970 and 71? I don't even remember the years, but it was the 70s. It was a long yeah. time ago. So... I've been pounding the table for this for months, and I'm not changing now. Give me Jordan Travis to win the Heisman, especially if Florida State wins the ACC. I could see Jordan Travis. I think he's got the perfect combination to do it. He's got elite receivers. He's a dual threat, and he could be on a winning team. Triple threat. Give me, give him the Heisman. All right, Marty? Well, I don't think Florida State wins the ACC. I don't think USC wins the Pac-12, and I don't believe – some Heisman voters are so stuck in their ways that even though Caleb Williams will probably deserve it, they'll refuse to vote for the same guy. I am going to go with, though, the best player in college football whose team is going to go to the playoff. Give me Marvin Harrison Jr. All right. A t- a two you're, entitled seat. Your, you're entitled to your own wrong opinion, Marty. That's okay. I, I'm just – listen, the, the, it's fair. the Sugar Bowl last year proved, in my opinion, Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best player in college football. He does not get hurt. Ohio State wins the national title last year. That's fair. Oh, no, I wasn't talking about Marvin Harrison. He absolutely is the best player in college football. I was talking about Florida State not winning the ACC. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. Well, <laughs> just Dabo, man. They're going to pray to the Lord and try so hard and they'll pull it out. The church right. of Dabo always wins. <laughs> All right. Now our college football playoff picks. All right. Um, let's do this by seed. Who's everybody's number one seed? I got Georgia. I also got Georgia. Uh, yeah, I didn't think this far ahead for seeding, but give me Bama since I have them winning the SEC, I guess. Yeah. I got that, it the uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and, and it would probably be similar for this number two one. Uh, who's everybody's number two pick? I'm going Michigan. I'm also going Michigan. Oh, uh, is the guy who didn't pick Michigan win the Big Ten. I'll stick with the Big Ten and give me Ohio State. All right. Um, number three. Um, I wonder if we all have the same team here. Uh, well, let's say at the same time. You ready? Three. You guys already said about three seats, so we don't all have the I, same. I, I, I oh. see your pick, and I don't. I don't have the same pick. Really? Okay. Fine. Why not? So, do either of you have my pick? Marty, Marty, you go first. Who's your three seat? I have Georgia because I don't think the okay. playoff committee is going to let Bama Georgia rematch in the first round. Okay. And then who's your three seat? I'm going Florida State, as I think they win the ACC. Right. I got Penn State at number three. Uh, who's your number fours? I'll go first. Going, I got USC at number four. I'm going Penn State at four. I am in the same boat, similar to Dylan. Pac-12, I think it's Washington. All right. So, my, well, my top four, Georgia, Michigan, Penn State, USC. Anthony, who's your top four? I believe I said Georgia, Michigan, Florida State, Penn State. And... Marty, what was your top four? 
Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, Washington. I'm the one guy on the Penn State pod that does not have Penn State in the playoff. Now you know who to direct your hate mail to, everybody. Marty, where can they find you on Twitter? <laughs> you can find me. No, I'm not, I'm not. Never mind. That was going to some trouble. What I was going to say. Can't find him. He's, he's gone. He deleted his Twitter. <laughs> move, move along. Um, all right. Uh, now, um, all right. Who's your? Who's in everybody's national championship game? Uh, I got Georgia, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. I don't know who's going to win the first round of Penn State, Michigan. But whoever wins that round, I think, is going to lose the second round in the playoffs. So Penn State could be the national championship, but it really doesn't matter because Georgia is going to win a third straight national championship this year. Uh, Marty, who's your national championship matchup and who wins? Um, it's super boring and super bland, but I think it's Alabama against Georgia. Ultimately, I think they're the two best rosters in the country, the two most talented teams in the country, and the two best coaching staffs in the country. Like I said, since 2008, Every time Bama has been picked to not win the SEC West, they've gone on to win the national championship. I think Saban is out to prove something this year. I understand the concerns of quarterback, but there's so much talent on that team combined with the motivation factor. And quite honestly with Georgia, it can be hard to stay motivated to win a championship three years in a row when you've done it twice. For Bama, this is rare territory. They haven't won a title since 2020. That doesn't happen in Tuscaloosa very often. There's a lot more guys in this roster who don't have a ring than you normally see. Give me the Crimson Tide to win it all. And Anthony, who is your, uh, I guess, championship matchup, and who's uh, who's taking it home? Yeah, I, I I love Penn State. I love you, Nittany Lions, but you're not beating Georgia in the playoff, and I that's okay. We can we can accept that. We can all come together. And that's accept acceptable. That. So give me Georgia and give me Michigan to beat Florida State. I think Michigan finally gets their shot at Georgia that they have been pounding the table for, you know, in you know on, on Twitter and Arbaugh's been talking about it. But I think they get their uh, their bell rung by Georgia just like everybody else has, and I think Georgia wins the national championship for the right. third time. So. so we definitely all think that. Uh, well, sorry, Marty, who is your pick? Alabama. Of course, he ruins it. All right. Well, me and me and Anthony uh, at least think Georgia dynasty lives on. Uh, Marty says, well, damn time, baby. Marty, well, damn Marty is the uh, Lee Corso of the group and says not so fast on the Alabama dynasty ending just yet. Um, all right, yeah. I I probably would lean Georgia-Michigan in the national championship as much as I think Penn State could beat Michigan once uh, in these two games. I, I, I'd probably lean towards them probably winning the first matchup, losing the second one. So give me Michigan, Georgia, Georgia winning. Um, all right, well, that was fun. And then last but not least, our rapid fire Big Ten Week One picks. We'll be doing Big Ten picks each week, straight up and against the spread. All right, rapid fire, everybody. I'm gonna say the I'm gonna say the game. I'm gonna say who I have winning against spread, straight up, and we'll just go Marty Anthony for each one. All right, Nebraska at Minnesota, Golden Gophers seven point favorite. Give me Nebraska against the spread, but Minnesota to win. Yeah, same thing. I think Huskers cover, but the Gophers win it. Yep. I'll say Minnesota wins and Minnesota covers. Like it. All right. Central Michigan and Michigan State Friday night. Uh, Michigan uh, Michigan State a 14-point favorite. Give me uh, the Spartans to cover and win straight up. Same thing. Give me the Spartans to just win it outright. Same thing. Next one. All right, East Carolina, number two, Michigan. Michigan, only a 36-point favorite. Uh, that's a lot of points, but give me Michigan to cover and Michigan to win. I think the Pirates cover between coaching staff issues. Seems like Michigan's going to not play a lot of guys this weekend also who are banged up still from camp. I think Michigan wins pretty easily, but I'll say East Carolina can cover 32 and a half. 36, not 32 and a half. Oh, 36. Oh, hell yeah, they're going to cover 36. Jesus, yes. But, yeah, I, I don't know how good this East Carolina team is. Um, but, yeah, obviously Michigan's going to win. But I could see East Carolina covering this one for a lot of the reasons Marty said. So, uh, Marty convinced me I'm going to go with uh, East Carolina to cover, but Michigan to win, obviously. I'm intrigued by the next one to see how you guys go. Utah State at number 25, Iowa. Iowa, 23.5 point favorite. Give me Iowa, Iowa to cover and win, but I think it's going to be like 24 nothing. 
Yeah, I also think they cover and win, but in just some ugly slop fest of a game that absolutely nobody wants to watch. Yeah, I, I don't know how they're going to get to 24 points, but they will. Maybe like two touchdowns of defense play. 12 safeties. <laughs> They'll be something you know like that. What? I feel like this one for me depends on if Nat McNamara plays or if Petrus plays. Because I know McNamara was dealing with that injury. Uh, if if McNamara plays, I think Iowa wins. Obviously, I, Iowa wins, but I think they cover. If Petrus plays, I could see Utah State covering because sure. he's just he, – they're not going to put up any points with him. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it really depends on the quarterback. Sure. That's what I'm going to say. Sure, that's fair. Uh, Fresno State at Purdue. Purdue are three and a half point favored. I have an upset here. Give me Fresno State to win outright and therefore cover. I am in the same boat, actually. I think the Bulldogs pull the upset. I think this is a Purdue team that's going to take a big step backwards this year. Yeah, give me the Bulldogs. You know what, boys? I'm going to rock with you guys. Give me Fresno State outright. Yeah. All right. Give them the upset. Ohio State, 30 point favorite at Indiana. Give me the Buckeyes to win and cover. Yeah, give me it, the Buckeyes big. It's going to be like 56 to like 17. I was going to say 56 to 7. I don't think Indiana scores anything. That's fair. I, I do think that this is Tom Allen's uh, swan song with the Hoosiers. Yeah. And that's a shame. That's a shame. I like it. Nice guy. Uh, but uh, the program sucks. Uh, Buffalo at number yeah. ni- 19, Wisconsin. Uh Badgers a 28 point favorite in Luke Fickle's debut. I'm kind of excited to see the new look Badgers and this offense. So give me Wisconsin. Uh, give me Wisconsin to cover and win outright. Yeah, same thing. I think the Badgers cover, win it outright. I, I think that uh, they'll dispatch a Buffalo pretty easy. I think this is a good Wisconsin team. Definitely could see them double digit wins and going to Indianapolis. Yeah, I agree. Wisconsin wins, Wisconsin covers. All right, Townsend versus Maryland. No line on this game right now. Uh, so give me Maryland to win. Um, it would be funny if they didn't, though. Yeah. Oh, it would be hilarious <laughs> if they lose to Townsend, but that's not going to happen. Give me the no. Terps to win by a whole bunch. And, and, yeah, to, be, and to be clear, it, it's funny when any F- FBS team loses to an FCS team. But, yeah. Uh, Unless, it's Maryland. Unless it's Penn State, of course. That That's the only exception. But – um, yeah, I, I'm with you. Maryland obviously is going to win this game. I think this is like an eight-win team. I think they're solid. So give me, give me Definitely. Maryland. All right, Toledo versus, versus Illinois. Illinois nine and a half point favorite. Give me the line out of cover and win this one outright. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Toledo is the best team in the MAC. I think they win the MAC this year. Um, so it won't shock me if they manage to cover and hang around. But I think you line. I probably win it by two touchdowns. All right. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, with that, that is officially our week one. Penn State and college football season preview. This was a jam-packed episode, everybody. Thank you for listening to all one hour and 20 minutes of it. Uh, And uh, enjoy the week one of the college football season. It all starts Thursday night with a couple good games. Florida versus Utah, Minnesota versus Nebraska. Got some Friday night football. uh, And then Saturday is the big day, of course, uh, leading up to Penn State versus West Virginia, 7.30 p.m. on NBC. Until we talk... I guess on Sunday, uh, to recap Penn State's uh, game against West Virginia. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Penn State 365 Podcast. We'll talk to everybody real soon. Enjoy the weekend, and if you're going to the game, stay safe, enjoy the game, and most importantly, have fun. We'll talk to everybody real soon.